Okay, welcome listeners. This is Barbara McDermott with Shift Formula, and it's my great privilege and honor to bring with you today our guest, Dr. Gurpreet Pada, an interventional pain physician. And my biggest question is, what makes you, Dr. Pada, so interested in, in this particular like metabolic field? Sure. So what I found in my patients, and I practice in the urban core, so I practice in St. Louis City, um, I found that my patients that I was practicing on, I could treat their pain directly. I could get to them and I could treat the one particular joint that was bad or the disc, but they would have recurrence and they would keep recycling over and over and over again. And so I tried to figure out why it is that they came to me in the first place, which was usually they had a traumatic event, but why was it that their pain was maintained? And then why was it that they would recycle? Why was it that they were coming back? And so the initial thing is you look at a patient, you go, well, God, they're really overweight because that's what you see. And then when you start measuring the metrics and you start looking at everything associated with them, and then you start spreading out from just the simple tests and you look at things like hemoglobin A1C, you start to look at insulin levels, you look at GGT for liver function you look at homocysteine levels and transferrins and you start getting a bigger picture of what's going on you realize that the patients are severely metabolically infl inflamed and it's metabolic inflammation i also have a background in addiction and that that combination with my background in pain and this discovery not discovery but uncovery for me of metabolic inflammation basically brought me to a common nexus. You know, here I am dealing with severely obese patients, patients with severe addictions, and patients with severe chronic inflammation and pain. They're the same patient. It's the same common nexus. And, and so that's how I ended up in this field. Um, I'm, I'm dealing with patients that are extremely sick, that, you know, they, they've become disabled because they can't function. And when you figure out what's causing that metabolic inflammation, it's our food supply. We have, you know, we have an epidemic of obesity. We have an epidemic of addiction. We have an epidemic of chronic inflammatory conditions. It's all interrelated. And pain is the common final pathway. It's, it's the scream that the body has. Something is wrong. And that's how, how they end up at me. You know, many of our shift insiders, what we call our clients, they shift, they become so much more powerfully aware of glucose heavy foods. You know, it's the, the carbohydrate category and uh, certainly the processed versions of our carbohydrate food are our highest glucose heavy foods, right? So many of our in our community, just by shifting the amount of glucose, I call it going from glucose stacking to actually being able to track they reduce glucose overburden, and naturally the insulin levels follow suit, right? They start to drop as well. And the relief from pain comes very quickly when we understand th that's, that pathway. It's just really powerful. Now, you talked a little bit earlier about, you know, the obesity. Is it an epidemic or is it pandemic? You know, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so, you know, I, I use the word epidemic because that's the one that everybody understands. Um, and I look at it this way. If I told you that there was a disease coming and it was going to affect 75% of the world's population and 90% of the people that got this disease were going to end up becoming pre-diabetic or diabetic and 30% of those were going to end up with end-stage renal disease, and just in the U.S., this disease was going to cost us $1.3 trillion a year. You'd be worried. This disease is here. This is called prediabetes, diabetes, and obesity. This disease is right in front of us. One out of every five children has this. So that's why I call it the epidemic. But it's more than that. It's a pandemic. And when you have a pandemic, you know it's not viral because not one virus doesn't go from species to species. You know that it's usually an environmental cause. And we call it a pandemic because the animals that eat the same food that we eat get the same diseases. The monkeys get the same disease, the, the dogs get the same disease, the cats get the same disease, 
the rats get the same disease. Anything that eats the food that we eat gets this. There was a beautiful study that was just done recently and it was done in New York. And what they did was they looked at obese rats because we've never had obese rats until recently. And now we've got these lumbering giant rats that have severe diabetes who are cognitively impaired because they've gotten diabetes and insulin resistance in their brain. And now they are wandering around the cities of New York. Normally rats are terrified of daylight and they scurry along the edges of things. Once you make a cognitively impaired rat, it just wanders in the middle of the street because it has lost its fear. It's cognitively impaired. This is very similar to what we have with Alzheimer's and cognitive impairment as we have type three diabetes of the brain in humans. So this is the pandemic that we face. And that pandemic, pandemic's central crux is our food supply. Um, you know, I, I love your guys' concept of shift. And the reason why I love it is because it goes to the heart of the problem. The heart of the problem is insulin resistance. And what happens when you shift your food supply, when you shift and change how you're eating, is that you have more hours that you're not eating than you are eating. And what's that, what that's doing is it's shifting the amount of stored glycogen that's in your liver. Your liver has a glycogen carrying capacity of 500 grams. Your bloodstream has a glucose carrying capacity of about five to 10, maybe 15 grams, but not more than that. And if you're eating 22 teaspoons of sugar a day, it only took you one teaspoon to overwhelm your blood capacity. The other 21 teaspoons went to your liver. And if you never depleted the glycogen reserve in your liver in the first place, it overflows. You become insulin resistant, you accumulate fat, and you become pre-diabetic and then eventually diabetic. So we need to have periods of time greater that we don't eat so we can deplete our glycogen reserves in our liver so that we can function. And, and that's one of the biggest problems that I find. We have a constant foraging of sugar and we never deplete the glycogen reserve that we have in our liver. And so we're always at that full status and we never deplete that. And I, you have to deplete that glycogen reserve. And I guess the challenge is, thank you for articulating that so, that was beautiful. Thank you, Dr. Pata. Sure. <laughs> what I run into with, our, with the, those we serve is the cravings, you know, the chemistry-driven desire to continue feeding. Uh, it's a very powerful, like you talk about you, the addiction piece of your metabolic, your, your medical background, you know? Can you talk a little bit about the addiction that is a real valid challenge for individuals in that situation? Yeah, so I think there's a couple of elements of addiction that we should really discuss. Mm -hmm. um, so our food supply is tainted and it's tainted in such a way that our large food manufacturers are manipulating the amount of fructose. And so if I told you that high fructose corn syrup is supposed to be 55% fructose, 45% glucose. That's what high fructose corn syrup is. But if, if I told you that they're manipulating the food supply so that it's 60% fructose, you would wonder why. They're, they're spending extra money. And normally these people save money. So why are they doing this? Because it's produced 55, 45, but you end up with 60, 40. And the reason why is that glucose does not activate as much dopamine release as does fructose. Fructose kicks in the nucleus accumbens and dumps a bunch of dopamine. And so you end up with an issue that you have a tremendous surge of dopamine that makes you want to eat again and eat again and eat again and eat constantly. So that's issue one. Our food supply is tainted in such a way that the processed foods are hyper addictive. And that's going to be a significant challenge. The second factor is that we have an epidemic, and I use the word epidemic in this particular case, of loneliness. And I'll explain what this means. So they did a beautiful rat study. Um, and we do rat studies all the time. We just happen to be the rats. But this was a particular rat study. And what they did was they took rats and they put them in a cage and they offered them water or they offered them cocaine plus water. And they said, what are these rats going to do? 
Well, the rats were in there by themselves. They found the water, they drank that, it was okay. They found the cocaine water and they couldn't stop drinking it. They drank it to the point where they were unconscious, they didn't eat food and they died. And so the natural conclusion from that was, if you give a addictive substance to a rat, it's going to consume that addictive substance to the point where it dies. And so that was the initial conclusion. And those rats could also be considered humans. You give an addictive substance to a human, they're going to eat it to the point where they die. And on that basis, when we had people coming back from Vietnam, we knew that about 60 to 70% of them had been using heroin or some form of amphetamine or some form of opiate that was highly addictive. We assumed that we, when these people came back from Vietnam, we would have zombies on the street and these would all be addicted people. But that's not what happened. Only 5% came back and had addiction. What happened to the rest? Why weren't they addicted? Because in Vietnam, they were addicted, but in the US, they weren't addicted. So they repeated the rat study this time. And same rats, or well, different rats, but same progeny. Um, and they gave the rats water, or they gave the rats cocaine plus water. But this time, what they did was they put them in an enhanced environment. They gave them the opportunity to play with other rats, to have sex with other rats, to have a maze and run around. You know what, lo and behold, none of those rats died because they weren't lonely anymore. They weren't isolated. They had other rats to play with. And so when I deal with weight loss management, my main thing is to generate a community for my people. And whether that's me interacting with their church groups and interacting in a way that allows them to communicate with each other and to co-share, we have to eliminate loneliness to treat addiction. Um, and so that's, that, that's how my addiction side becomes, becomes more and more relevant for me, is that we have to realize that a big part of addiction is loneliness. It's not just the substance, and it's not just your genetics, it's your interaction with society. And we would think that we have all this cool tech, that we have Facebook and we have Twitter, but that's actually creating more loneliness because it, there's not a true human interaction. And so that, that's why, you know, I, I think that that's relevant. Absolutely. You know, the, that chemistry of love, right? Yeah. How emotionally we have neurotransmitters that are released the same way. I always say gossip, chocolate chip cookie, and love. There's a lot of similarities between the three and gossip meaning a good thing. It's community, you know, but right. it's really powerful when you can simplify it down and, Wow, that, they are profound studies. Thank you so much for sharing that in such a sure. easy, digestible manner. We talked a little bit before this podcast about your work uh, with the prison system. Do you want to want to segue into that? Yeah, so I grew up, I, I actually grew up in India. I moved to the U.S. when I was probably about eight or nine, and I became integrated into the U.S. school system. So I was here in the probably early, uh, mid-70s. The dietary guidelines kicked in and were being discussed in 1977, and they were implemented in 1980. The dietary guidelines from the U.S. specifically stipulated that we should eliminate saturated healthy fats and replace them with vegetable oil. And as we did that, they also recommended that artificial sweeteners were a good thing and that we should start using those. And when we replaced the vegetable, when we, when we started to demonize fat, especially the good fat, and replace with vegetable oil, we started to increase the amount of carbohydrates that we provided. So it's interesting, you know, here I am as a little kid, and I'm in India, we're thin as a rail because we don't have enough food, um, and we use regular saturated fat. And yet in the US, as, as people, as I saw immigrants that were here in the US, and I was in the St. Louis City public school system. As we saw this transition, people started to get fatter. And we really see the takeoff of obesity in 1977 to 1980. And there's a direct vertical climb from there up. And you can see it on, on every obesity epidemic chart that you can find. So we see this epidemic of obesity. Why is this relevant to, to criminals? Why is this relevant to, to jails? Why is this relevant to schools? Jails and schools are an amazing rat cage because the dietary guidelines control the food 
that those kids get. And a lot of times in the urban core, that may be the only meal of the day that the kid gets. So the kid's getting a specific meal formulated by US dietary guidelines. That meal dietary guideline stipulates how much carbohydrate and how much vegetable oil they get. What we found was that the rates of ADD started to climb. And by the mid 80s, we had a serious issue. ADD rates were going up and, it, and school issues for kids were going up and their exposure to criminality was going up and they were getting kicked out of school. They were ending up in prison systems. And then the food is even more controlled there. So now we have a prison system that's feeding very similar. And what happens is that these people end up becoming disenfranchised because when they get out, they can't vote anymore. And their specific community is suffers because they, they lose the population that votes. And they, it suffers because they've lost the economic force that would have been productive. And we sideline these people and we disable them and then we have to pay for them. So as, 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 a, as a society, what we're doing is we're creating our own mess. We're incarcerating people because of the food that we give them because it increases their likelihood of ADD and, and oppositional disorders. And at the end of it, we, we end up basically criminalizing everything for them uh, and they can, they can never function. So we end up, it ends up costing us as a society because of the food that we subsidize, that we pay for to give to these people to do our, our large, large volume rat study. Um, so th that, that's, that's, that's how I kind of got involved. So I've been working with groups like Exoneration Nation, uh, which is people that have been released from prison and almost all of them come out with severe metabolic dysfunction. Almost all of them are exposed to basically vegetable oil, high amounts of grain and high amounts of sugar. And they're all coming out pre-diabetic or diabetic, insulin resistant. And when you have that confluence, you increase the risk of solid tumors. You increase the risk of cancers, Alzheimer's disease, and all of those other expenses. And it, it, it's gonna create a tragedy for us. Uh, so I've been trying to work at the school system level and at the, at the prison level to change those controlled environments to help people. On a very personal level, I can share, we have a dear friend who was incarcerated uh, just for a, a few years. This man came out of that serving time so severely diabetic, he could barely walk. Uh, since shifting, you know, he's reversed it. But I remember that moment in my life, looking at this individual and the little I had gleaned already from my child's type one glucose impaired life, right? And then being able to see what it was that, that happened to this man. And then as a school teacher, I can't tell you how many times I have seen children disciplined for uh, behavioral outbursts after <laughs> the parents and the faculty gave the children ridiculous amounts of sugar in the form of some kind of reward system. You know, we reward our children with the very kinds of foods that are going to promote the inability to control one's behavior and outburst. It's like, it's like giving a child a, a giant piece of candy and then reprimanding them for, you know, calling out loud in church, you know? I mean, that's a real simple, simplified version of it, but it's, it pretty much hits at home, doesn't it? Yeah. If you've ever been to a uh, nutrition conference, um, which I've been to, the biggest sponsors of nutrition, con of, con of nutrition conferences are typically these big food companies. And they're basically selling, quote, healthy bars. And they're basically Snickers bars. And I don't want to belittle Snickers. I'm not trying to, but they're, they're basically candy bars. And yeah, they have some protein in them, but they're basically processed, high glycemic index, processed sugar. Um, and even when it's, quote, fiber, um, it still has a ton of other compounds in it. And you know, some of the whitening agents cause tremendous leaky gut, like titanium dioxide, that, which is basically what causes something to be white. Um, so, I mean, when we process these foods and we get farther and farther away from how they were really intended, um, that processing destroys our metabolism. It destroys our gut bacteria. 
and it changes the absorption of, of short chain fatty acids and it changes the absorption of carbohydrate. Um, and so, you know, it, it leads to what part of what the calorie paradox is. Um, you know, a calorie of this is not a calorie of this. It depends on what happens with that calorie and the information contained within it and all of the milieu of everything around it. Yeah. Yeah, it's so complicated. And yet when someone like you, you know, puts it out there for the rest of us, it's, it's much more easy to understand and to see. And then, you know, uh, the application of it can get a little tricky because my gosh, we're inundated, right? The world is a, it's like we're bombarded with food meshes, messaging, social cues and goodness grief, everything else, right? Well, I mean, it's like the message of cereal. Um, you know, breakfast is the healthiest meal of the day. It's only, it's, it's not the best meal of the day, except for the cereal company. Because if you eat breakfast, two hours later, you're going to be hungry. And then you're going to eat in two hours. And then you're going to eat in two hours. And then you're going to eat in two hours. And if you spend your entire day eating every two hours, you never depleted your glycogen. If you never depleted your glycogen, you became insulin resistant. And 28 days later, you're going to have a serious problem. And so I'm surprised that we don't have more diabetes, actually. Uh, the the human, humans are very hard to kill. And I'm really surprised that not everybody's diabetic. Um, because they should be based upon the way that we have feeding cycles. Uh, thank God that we have a complex ab adaptive system that allows the progeny to proceed. But there, there's some serious issues with our food supply. We don't have an epidemic of, of impotence just for, for nothing. I mean, we, you know, it, that's, it's, it's another area that I find that people don't realize that the vegetable oil antagonizes nitric oxide synthesis and nitrous, nitric oxide synthesis is necessary to get erection. Um, and so that's one of the reasons, it's not the only reason, but it's one of the reasons why our birth rates are falling. It's also the epigenetic effect of some of our sugars that we're eating, that we're predisposing our kids to becoming diabetic. We're doing that in the womb and we're doing that a generation back. So it's, what we're dealing with is a massive thing. I would put this, at a climate level. I mean, we've, we've got a climate issue, but the dietary issue is a climate issue it, because it's so pervasive. And you, I, you hit the nail on the head for me <clears throat> for the next generation. Again, as a school teacher, as a parent, I see our children and our children's children having to bear the burden of being raised in this environment, you know, and the least we can do is shed some light on it, make some changes in our own lives, be an example, you know, to get that ripple out effect going. You know, I'd love to see shift getting into the school system. You know, if the young people just understood what it was all about, they'd be like, wait a minute, I can handle this. You know, we can, we can shift the way we eat if we just understand how it all works. You know, it's- Yeah, it's really I, I agree with you. It's, it's a fundamental misunderstanding, but it's not amongst the lay public. You know, I have to tell you that 75% of physicians, there was a study done by Credit Suisse, which is an insurance company, and they're, they are the smartest people in the room. There's nobody smarter than an insurance company because they're insuring when you die so that they don't have to pay you. And they're trying to figure it out because you're paying them and they want to figure out how not to pay you. So they're trying to figure out if you're going to die early or if you're going to die late. And they do all kinds of calculations and they did a beautiful study where they figured out how much do physicians know and what do physicians think? And the vast majority of physicians continue to suppose that the saturated fat that you eat is the cholesterol in your bloodstream. They have missed the point that the cholesterol in your bloodstream is not the saturated fat that you ate. You know, just because you have cholesterol in your blood and it's sitting as an atheroma on your coronary artery, that may not be a, the fat that you ate. That may be the secondary response from inflammation. And that may be the recovery molecule. That may be the, the, the marker of injury, and it may not be the cause of injury. And so glucose is, is glucose and vegetable oil and things that make leaky gut. Those are the causes. And we, we need to step a step back and we need to also recognize the incentive that people have that drives this. 
because the thing is the incentive that a physician has, like if, if I was playing a game and we were playing, we were doing game theory and I asked myself, how do I make the most amount of money? Well, I want the sickest patients. Well, how do I get the sickest patients? Well, I delay my treatment to the point where they're sick and they're dependent upon me. So what that means to me is if I'm treating pre-diabetic patients, I don't want to treat them at a hemoglobin 5.7 or 5.7. I'm going to wait till 6.5 when they're on insulin and then they have to come in and I can possibly do an amputation or I can do X, Y, Z. So institutions will wait till the hemoglobin A1C is sufficiently high enough to start some of the more expensive drugs and treatment. And that, that you know, I'm a cynic. So I, I have a background in economics as well. And so I look at things as a game theory. If I'm completely cynical, what would I do? As a drug company, even though I was given insulin for a dollar and I was told to give it, provide it freely, what I'm going to tell you is I'm going to modify this free insulin a little bit and I'm going to charge for it. And that's exactly what happened. Insulin got the Nobel Prize in Canada. It was given by the Nobel laureates to the insulin companies who were to ever forever provide it for free. And they changed it slightly so they could charge $1,200 a month in a subscription program that you have to pay for for the rest of your life. That's not cool, but that's the model. And so, you know, you, you have to look at people's drivers. With big food companies, their driver is to sell as much food as they can at the lowest possible cost at the highest frequency. So they have to figure it out and they have to apply the technologies they have. And when we got rid of smoking, when we, when we finally said, hey, smoking is bad for you, the big smoking intelligentsia moved over to the big food companies to figure out how to increase the likelihood of consumption. Um, and so we're going to see a similar thing with the marijuana industry. You're going to see a large shift of the intelligentsia from alcohol and cigarettes and food to the marijuana industry to figure out how to make a previously non-addictive, essentially plant become hyper addictive. So we're going to see a shift on that eventually. Um, it'll happen in the next five or 10 years, but that, that's, you have to figure out what people's motivations are. Well, Dr. Pata, you made my day. You shared so many wonderful stories that really uh, helped me to really visualize things. You know, I tend to be a little bit naive. I, um, but that whole, in you know, the story about the insulin, good grief. One of my greatest, I don't know, feel goods about my life is I help people get off insulin. What a wonderful thing to not need to take insulin any longer. That's powerful. And, you know, to wrap this up, I want to say a, a big thank you again for taking the time and something I'd seen on your website that spoke to me. You use the term citizen scientist. You know, you're the kind of doctor who steps over the line and reaches down and lifts the rest of us up, gives us the awareness and, um, you know, just the concepts that opens our eyes and makes us take a second look at things, you know? When our loved ones are suffering, when people in our lives or ourselves are struggling, to understand that the bigger powers aren't really working for us. You know, we, we are very, like this gal had been, naive, thinking that I was in good hands or my daughter was in good hands. She wasn't. You know, we do have to, we do have to do a little sleeve rolling up and digging in and taking a hard look at things. So thank you yeah, for it, doing that. It, and my point is not to be a conspiracy person. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to leave you guys there, but no. I, I just worry that, it, you know, that the motivations have to be perfectly clear for everyone. Uh, and you have to understand where their motivations are, whether they realize them or not. Yeah. Um, and, and that, you know, my, my hope is that people get the education that they need to take care of themselves. Absolutely. And we are not of the platform that medications are wrong or bad. Goodness, no. A body needs insulin to stay alive. But oh, yeah. when we're seduced or misled into believing it's an answer, it's the, you know, <laughs> just keep using it. Keep dosing more. Mm, that's not a good idea. You know, it's not so much. Uh, I didn't feel spiritual at all that from you. Yeah. No. <laughs> just this is what it is you know just don't be so naive take a hard look at the facts and roll up your sleeves and get some work done right get some action going exactly well dr gupreet 
Pada, thank you so much for your time. It is sure. it's a pleasure. I hope our paths cross again. I'm going to be following you, so just watch out, okay? All right, thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay, bye-bye for now.